This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good afternoon, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for being here. I'm Bob Hess, I'm filling in for Giovanni Singleton, our uh, administrator of, the, of Lunch Poems. I've been reading Leonore Wilson's, Leonore Wilson's poetry for 30 years, maybe 20 years anyway. Uh, she, um, is the poet laureate of Napa, California. She grew up in, uh, in California and, and uh, lives on the f farm ranch of her family. She's a writer uh, from the beginning for me, the first time I laid eyes on her work, of, of terrific vividness. Um, the world comes alive in her poems. She has a great feeling for the California coast and a kind of California landscape. And there's something fierce, solid, I wanted to say almost maternal, if that's OK to say, about uh, the way she cares for the world. I was looking at the quotations of the various poets who love her work and have tried to convey a sense what it's like. And they're, they're all struggling toward what I was found myself struggling toward a way of saying this. Um, Kathy Coleman says, a profound, wide-ranging, original, and feminine mind, that a lush, passionate voice that is all impulse toward, all sense of the world, the world that's out there that needs to be seen, and by being seen, known, and taken care of. My friend Joe Ahern says, um, uh, the bright and difficult bursts of souls and poems in these wise and intricate, beautiful pieces of writing. Read them, he says, and become more human. Uh, Gary Short also talks about the way she bodies forth the world, just makes it solidly alive. If, if the world is in the care of poets, Leonora is the poet you want it to be in the care of. Her Western Solstice is published by, um, uh, who is it published by Leonora? Her books, and uh, it's there, and she'll be happy to sign copies for you after. I'm very glad to have her here this afternoon. Please welcome Leonore Wilton. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here, especially in the presence of Bob Hass, who's been a mentor of mine for many years. I'm going to read. A few poems from Western Solstice, but a new book uh, just came out um, called Tremendum Augustum, which means the awe-inspiring of the mysterious and the spiritual. And since it's Lent, um, I thought I'd read more poems from there because that's the direction my poems are moving. This is from Western Solstice. The creation of desire Suppose it was an eighth day after God had rested when he retained some vigor and without knowing it, out of sheer boredom, he dreamt of the lascivious thought of rumps and necks and breasts, releasing such energy that the sun in the heavens grew jealous. Suppose God, after rinsing his great shoulders and shaking his head, said there must be something beyond me some wild strength and matter that rises, swells like the surf, so that the heart bends in ecstasy, something that will make the flesh blossom, vibrate, seethe unequivocally, yes, some yearning, deepening in man. So he pulled out of himself, 
out of the thousand threads that hold him fast, so every fiber of his body will whinny and shimmer and birth. Something will lure him back to me among the wet grasses and spongy tussocks, some booming in his breast, some pulsing and thudding, such that he will praise an unrelenting hallooing, so that he will razzle the feather of laughter and gorge on pleasure. He will detect it everywhere, even in the shadows splatter, so audacious will he be with delirium in each nanosecond of happiness. He will speak in proclamations, and so on the eighth day God invented desire. Out of the sound of rain and a man and woman running a bit, out of light flecks and spores and bejangled roots and rifled leaves, and in the brightest day alive, henceforth desire came. World as church. Just think of the blossoming parsnip or the button quail as divinity. Try to see the rising moon as so or the touch of the iris tongue, also the early hawk as it perches on the black oak or the thin, lanky hindquarters of the ant, the matted camellias thundering the porch with petal. Discover the small motes of the dried pea, its husk like the cry of the pine cricket, and the dogma of arroyos and snow melt, the passion of needle grass and berries and mistletoe in December when it reaches out to us with its heady medriff. The world is church, is chapel, altar, blood, and body, in its soft skin and its fervor, in all the salt vacancies of the ocean and dawn and dusk. The affirmation of God collects in the russet-headed grass of summer, and in the tattered fungi, and the fistfuls of snails and sand verbena, and the wings of the sycamore. The hedgehog in his hole knows the wisdom of Leviticus, considers passages from Proverbs, because his face is always open to the glaze of morning, as is the nude body of the seahorse under the ocean's momentum. Everything of earth is a krill of the cathedral. The field and forest anticipates its potential as assuredly as the barn owl crouches to unwrap the bowl with its talons. The gospel manifests itself in the facets of light and the falling of water. Angels, both of them, what more proof do we need that pollen hold reverence and constellations hold transformation. What proof exists at the core of the orb is therefore asking there like any element in abiding beauty, the wholeness of the finite fucking for our delight. That was from Western Solstice and now I'll approach my new book. Tremendum Augustum. Matter's power consoles. Take, for instance, a woodpecker's tongue, how it whips around the little Jerusalem of his brain, then darts out quite suddenly, sweet swoop flame, incandescent God. This is wisdom's dizziness, what the depressive forgets as he rotates daily in the unending azura of thought. Heavy rain all winter, then up from the Herculean depths, numinous lilies like dulcet-toned instruments, harps, zithers, flutes, the fugitive fabric of what is inevitable, daunting as when one evening the lonely astronomer stared out in the Codium universe and discovered the region of space beyond Neptune where vast numbers of small icy objects circle the sun in cold storage. Such is the overabounding trace of survival, the majestic energy that beckons the diminution of self analogous to the mornings when trying to make love, the couple were simply too distracted by the exalted song of the May bird, a western tangier, perhaps, ruddy orange jester, gleaning its way from oak to conifer as a beatific heart in the sky intensified. So the embarrassed, their 
the abandoned their inchoate ritual and lay there apart in humble submergence and private devotion. Pregaria. Admonishment no more, as we covered him with splayed sheaves gleaned from the desert fields. The calf butchered became the thick bawling in my throat. Then the once quiet wick of my tongue unleashed flame. All resilience and thirst I had kept invisible since he was a mere finger whorl inside my blood. Prescient weed growth of limbs, rock cape of shoulders where the knurled wood found promise. What was in me, I believe, tore from heaven to hell, joining the golden sparks of those departed, and then I retreated behind my own stony cerement, where none who inquired could find me. Chagall's Animals. In the cereal blue over Vitabisk village roofs, bright orange fish with wings and snakes worthy of thought, animals of the painter's childhood, lambs brought to slaughter, martyred cattle, butchered goats, those he caressed before their death and asked forgiveness so the wounded were not wounded or condemned or abandoned, beasts tossing about in the heavens like rose petals over Adam and Eve, Calvary, and the raising of Lazarus, blue ponies mounting the ocean's pinnacles, carps singing, herald angel birds and seraphic horses brilliant and noble, Hear the word of God and paint like the dawn's troubadour piercing the heart, that tenacious dogged flower, animals of stable and barnyard, of unattainable myths soaring over little votive chapels, which rise like the voice and verse in the green song of hope, full of zeal and triumph over Esau and birthright, over Isaac's near sacrifice and Hagar's casting forth, over the burnt up land where light overtakes shadow, over rifles and bayonets and headlamps, over the executioner and gangs of orphans, lovers floating on pools of water, and pallid orphans, beggars, tricksters, over charwomen and virgins, fish with hovering sails, vipers and turtle doves, genderless creatures of every species, docile, released like fragrance, sweet incense, all with kindly merry mother faces. Body without mirror, after Francesco Clemente. So try to see with him that the body is a comma in the text of the infinite, shelter between the external world and the inner, and the skin is the region in common between the space of a room and the space inside the body. There is this landscape of the world in inner matter. The inner influx as much as the outer, face of the earth changing as much as the imagination. So looking this way, there's no mirror, only a blending or wanting to blend and try to understand with them that the life of the imagination is just as real as the rational. The rational is a form of the imagination. Rational things are not any more necessary than imaginary things. They are just more substantial. All are real to the same degree. For instance, art and the atomic bomb have the same degree of reality in them. Everything is as vital as the other, no part of the self in charge, no need for integration when the fragmentary brings freedom, survival. And looking this way is quite becoming. So when your pen pulls memories into words from your imagination, you are as powerful as a llama or a shaman or the hawk grabbing the rabbit up in his talons from the Pacific. Brussels sprout fields, and the cry of the rabbit is the first cry of the newborn, or the just coming into. 
Follow me, reader. These places in your imagination frighten you, but you are no less frightening than the reality of those who lost everything during the Depression or the Holocaust or the fire that gutted out the transient hotel on Lombard Street this April. Now looking this way is peaceful, is it not? Is nothing more lovely or terrifying? See, the gorgeous white lily is no more gorgeous than the daisy or the weedy jimson or the dandelion, and the words that spring from your pen stir up memory are equal to the memory itself, equal to the beauty of the day outside, which you are a part of. And yet the inside is just as rich with smell and taste. The newspaper's headline no more important than the scribbling of a poem that comes to nothing. The first draft and the final draft are as significant as the flower and bud and the flower full bloomed, the nectar waiting there and the honey thereafter. Frank Sonata in A major, which is my favorite piece of music. Like a long-tailed star, lamp beating beneath your skin, the violin waves, white caps entombed, always since you heard it first. Imagine Swan hearing it too in a drizzly cold cafe in Paris, or Neruda lighting a cigarette or biting an apple as if it were a note both embracing the shoals of music, writer and composer enjoined, a sort of love cycle, violin and piano intertwined, the cry of each, how it calls and calls again, like the suitor at Penelope's window, the unraveling and unraveling of the loom, this undertaking distillation like the animal sense of loss when my mother played it with all the weight of Tamelicus in her fingers, this longing to be safe and whole, thick sorrow edging there, the wanting to be listened to, half-mated desire when she turned down the stereo just to hear the strings, the croon, while she sat at the white keys and then the resting between movements, quivering pelt of silence, brook water held between stones while the lodestar of language gathered up, the blending of instruments, morning moon against sunrise, Oh, this music that idled in you all through childhood, unsortable mix of sorrow and desire, gene pool that echoed and ached, unsettling yearning, bleeding memory of it in your mouth like the host albifying, the shadow-stricken earth swinging like a censer, suffusing the air with its gnomic wisdom, this pitch blue milk of the indivisible, your own private Troy. La Merge. Maybe death is a little siren employing you to live, as in the bronze sculpture by Claudel, coaxing you who sleep so fitfully, still overwrought by the suicides of the beloved two you took into your heart. One died by hanging, the other by poison. And your healer says hypnos is ruptured because you are willing yourself to die like them, your soul grown worn at the edges, your dreams bedeviled as you are always a youth in there, youth neglected, taunted for unconformity, body languid, purgatoried, soft whole eating food as if it were affection, pedestrian, your female flesh growing corpulent, and those around you noticed throwing grass in your hair. Even the skinny boy who vomited teased you with his pink eraser. Where are they now, those who stuck you with pens? O oh, Saint Sebastian of the schoolyard. Girl of bruises and shut mouth that rarely opened for fear, crouched inside you like a mouse. You who watched the funeral processions from your classroom window, wanting to be part of the long cortege of every young soldier killed in Nam. You who refused to look at your open school book when the nuns instructed. 
girl who envied the one beside her, who brother never came home whole from war, but pieced in a casket, flag draped, she who remained tainted and holy in the barracks of your heart, who never cried but was poplar at recess, could do double dutch as well as the other girl, who never showed grief, but played with her long strawberry braids as if it were a rosary bead. You wanted to touch her, didn't you? Touch the crooked gardenia behind her ear. You knew her street, but you were her, for what is imagined is belief. The angels. Maybe those stone angels with the cracked elbows holding up the organ pipes hold up the entire world after all. Maybe we are all flawed in specific ways, like the blind calf that followed its mother through the pastures of clover, oblivious to the fact of slaughter as the mother was oblivious, for in spring the mud swallow was having its fledglings, as was the flycatcher, both returning to the same nesting place from the previous year and littering the ground with waste and the tearing of feathers. The angels know the man with the white cane has practiced and practiced his route over the bridge of the Seine where the lockets of lovers remain. He recognizes some of those lovers are no longer netted in affection, but are strained as a riverboat that carries its passengers is strained as the passengers live in constant disdainful anxiety to fill their eyes and their ears with the senses and even their mouths with the sharp sensation of lemons and quinces picked by the laborers whose hands get little recognition. For even the laborers know a spot of dirt will always cling to the fruit, though it is rinsed daily before display. We are all of us moving as the swans move, migratory over the waters in winter. And in summer, we return to the same little pool next to the carousel that moves like a timepiece, timepiece like the blue dashes of paint Miro swathed on his most beautiful of canvases, wanting us to see that through his eyes, the same spacious blue field, blue a symbol of a world of cosmic dreams, the unconscious, where his mind flowed clearly and without any order. Blue, the color of a surreal, ethereal night, a night embodying the only place where dreams could exist in their untainted, uncensored, raw state. Tecton. Before they pinned him to the cross, he stroked the gravid wood for he was a pupil enthralled with cuts, chisels, saws, hammers, the whole ritual of skilled dissection, of exacting measurements and cunning assembly and disassembly, efforts that came together to form a bed or gallows, the frame of a house or that of a spirit, a phrase, a sentence, an argument, the balance and hangs on words, for carpenters were also known as scholars, authors. And so when he heaved the plain limbs upon his back, he shuddered, for his thoughts were fractious, bumping, shouldering up to one another, shoving other thoughts aside, all of them racing toward understanding, for he was not beyond reproach, shame, or risk. This one born from a handmaiden, her lowliness, though later she'd be deemed as blessed, he knew he couldn't love her deeply, for there would come a day when darkness would enshroud them both. How he imagined her head thrown back, convulsing with grief, the ferocity of sorrow. She would be torn with emotion, so he embraced her rarely. There was a great gulf between them. There had to be for he knew he was a source of unimaginable to come. How he locked his heart and took the tools in his hands instead, sealed fountain of a man ungraspable.
Uh, this next poem is an elegy to my friend who took his life. Good Friday, an elegy for Lynn. I walk the city like a widow, no anchor, core, or center. In my assembling of want, I walk, not stroll, domination of my heart's need. In the undifferentiated litany of Holy Week, I walk since after three years, the brain-crushing hour still exists since you took your life. My traitor, how I want to exercise you, purge you like poison, you who thrive in the largesse of my psyche. There are things worse than death, that is, to leave the living languishing in exile, watching the clock secondhand sway slowly as a bayonet. I follow block after block, my shoulders ache, my throat dry, as if everything's obscured by a crypt of haze, though the breath of spring glistens on the faces of errant dogs and ailing beggars, and the church bells ring out as if to stop this incessant thinking of you in your 50s flat overlooking the starling song, the red camellias bursting big as teacups, how my mind compiles the dates when you stayed alive and why. Afternoons we deliberated over things that were common knowledge and things ineffable when I believed in happiness, lying in your curtained bed with the freshened linen over us. Life was often cruel and senseless, except for you who could make windmills appear out of thin air, windmills and a river, meadows and green willows, you who can make the whole of nature gentle and dreamy as you glided over your tartan rug in your blue dressing gown and served me tea and jam on a silver tray, making broad sweeps of your arms as if you were the Lenten full moon itself making waves. You wanted love, that innocuous little cloud that turned into a blaring wind. You wanted a man to fit your formant not a woman, certainly not one married, a mother of parasitical milk and Saturn shadows. Your despair was fueled by sickbed fools who crooked their middle fingers and left you swelling in regret. You were like me, seeing every tragedy as some postmodern resurrection. Bodies were vehicles of suffering, and you became the candles, the flowers, the pall, to those who determined your damnation. What a landslide of buried louts of those who told you about their harpy needs, which meant all the time you spent with them was followed by an indiscretion. Not yours, theirs. They were scavengers. Disgruntled seeing you as a moment's property, cursory fortune, something to fee a venial appetite. And you, my fool, thought your own self-effacing humiliation, your unease could buoy up the living. Ha, now look at what is left of us, I say. Here, let me whisper you a dozier of truth. I confess I am transfused in the marrow of your bones, your ash, your living twin always waiting for that jolt of clarity to make me cease, keep me from these tired routes up and down in this imploding city of St. Francis. But there is no solid place where I can grieve, no plot, no headstone, no hand-swept lawn, no path end or stone bench where winter bulbs hence march upon, chalice-like upon the land. No, instead, I smell the soot of you everywhere, in your quiet haunts, the leather bars, the shabby bookstores, the queue of foreign cornered cinemas. I see your hoodwinked eyes hidden under the skinny claws of a hundred black umbrellas. I taste your body in the tumult and torpor of each Catholic schoolboy carrying a sack of sex like something uncomely. I feel your sweaty, unshaven cheek, your held rope swinging above me like the rankled ticking of a heartbeat. I am the house you arsoned, the garbage you left rotting, you who glare at me like every stillborn saint from a towel-sized cathedral window. 
where God in his calamity of angels and all too human longing was jealous of his son and hung him on a cross. Dear confidant, forgive me. I took your corgi, your sickly beast, the one you disowned, your pricey papered pedigree. I expected him to be my foxhole buddy, my furry renegade. Instead, he vomited, he bled, he wouldn't eat, staining my carpets with his grief. His mouth indeed would open, but he never howled, his silence unbearable, leaving my dry cabin empty as a ghost. No, I didn't have to coax him to his death. He lay there on the metal table with his twiggy rib cage heaving and took his execution like communion. As I knelt and rubbed his skull down with my fist, while my glib soul grew oddly happy with relief. I left your favorite coats at the cleaners, the soft as dune grass jackets, one ripped like human flesh, as I imagine your mind was that awful goodbye day in February, when you tied yourself to the basement ceiling, mad Prometheus of your own doing, kicking in midair, suffocating in high relief. I cannot retrieve your moldy calf skins you shed before you fled. They've been on meat hooks for months. They scare me, totems of your bullying and dread, frightful as morning suits worn at a funeral. You had none, no service that is, no incense censored above your name, no eulogy, no celebration of what you stood for. No one wanted it. You left no instructions. You just pitched yourself into the void, your invidious tongue nailing every obscenity down before you leapt into the pyre. So what do I want from you? Not your clothes, your scalpulas, your dirty books, your whips, your pantry of Santeria statues, not your poems or your opiates. You see, I'm flogged forward in this nightmare of bereavement. I walk at amphidium as if moving is some palliative or prayer, as if in my exodus I will find the meaning to this malady and absolve you, my love, my animus, you who left my thinning spirit raging like a sibyl. You could have given me some prescient warning like a foghorn. Your father snuffed himself out with a hose, your uncles with guns one by one. And so you phoned saying, never, never, I promise you, the losers, but ah, oh, my f***ing liar, savior Judas. Then cease my constant drifting. Give me good reason you chose to be the final family idiot who did. Um, next one is a poem to the Russian poet Tsevetsa, I hopefully I'm saying her name right. I had another friend who took her life, and her favorite poet was this Russian poet. Letter to Tsevetsa. You were afraid of cars, of elevators, of wide open spaces, who lost your way in unfamiliar surroundings. You, Marina of salty peasant eyes, Today, in March, on the white veranda of a lone ranch house, I hear Rimsky Korsakov's string quartet from old St. Petersburg. What ordinary human happiness and wines from simple wooden instruments. What onslaught of doyen tenderness. What breath and verse. Yes, I think of you, my comforter, with your profound indifference to certain rules and taste, your poverty and hardships, the tragedy within yourself, how you said you terribly disliked living. No, it was not the daily scavenging for frozen potatoes or small cheap apples. It was not the growing isolation or the catastrophe of war. No, it was the deadliness like a hangman's noose swaying inside your chest, the hatred of self that taunted your heart such that you ran from one lover to the next, steeped in a snowstorm of unimaginable longing. You who tried on death so many times, 
Forgive me, I hope, to leave you an open seat next to the blooming rosemary, but so many came to listen, and I could only imagine your glance, heavy, inquisitive, your gray face nodding with a protective shield of grief. I wanted to stay, say, stay, spirit, stay, and fill your empty glass with the ripening music of the hour in the very bell of the living as bowstring touches bow, as the velvet tulips open to the gentle pulse of moss. O oh, steely posture, you, always playing Job, Take the youthful hand of the eager violinist, the one whose bun of hair is bundled wheat, with tiny bruises like blue badges around her jaw, where holding up the notes has punished her in ardor. Morena, maybe then the shame that knit your brow would flee, and the succor you only dreamed of like a forgotten book will open as once it did, when you were a child at Three Pond Lane, when the future was brighter than a rowan berry's flame or the ring of dusky campfires you lit that lasted until dawn. Oh, I have to read one about my son. <laughs> Blind bird. He knows I've been ill. So what does he do, this son of mine, but sweep me down the fragrant trail where the white laura is bountainous? The sinewy, sinewy oaks are shipwrecks of muscle, and the corkscrew water grooves the land, where he first knew the diners of death sprouting from the marrow of rotting she-fox and cow. He shows me the republic of his boyhood, laid out beneath the raised brow of the old weathered ranch house. Here we scan the seated pastures, mother and child, nearly sleepwalking now, and he asks me if I see the haphazard stones lying like requiems of night-fallen comets, and I do always believing the winter storms had yanked them tail first from the hard shanks of mountains. But no blind bird I was. I'm told he had hurled them there, he and his brothers, their eyes straight as graves, small-fisted lords, defending the bound fecundity of my womanly kingdom. Naked. After they rolled the dice and whispered as if he had no presence, and grain by grain, particle by particle, the night things stirred. The new sun like a boat of gold, the splinters of light rising like sap, haunch by haunch, filling the boredom of now it is over. The matter of stars coming out like a thousand adulteries. The shouts of the earth diminishing and the horse scents overlapping. He lay there in the dirt, completely unguarded, the long, narrow bars of the body called root, the sil slivered curve of the spine, seed pod bearing witness to the scene, blemish dragged marked beauty, the reconciled dissolving, rotting, the funneled lily flung backwards. Here, lying separate, abandoned, raw and rudimentary, a condemned man, unparticular as bottom rushes and leaves, bare as white water, hammer of thunder, razor of lightning, heart drowning, following one step behind in its riffle of blood, proof of the nothing exceptional or manifested, no rumor of resurrection or fragrant ritual, only the shape, narrow shoulders hunched over like a vestigial claw. And I will read one more. After the crucifixion. See her hurrying forth, saying goodbye to the ruined light abandoning generations with a wave of her hand, the dark passage of her body trembling, wrapped in a shroud of private fever, retreating like the syllable of a dove, white moon caught in a halo of fire, 
rivulet of sweat on her brow. Is she more beautiful now since he has gone? What cold joy blossoms in her, enough perhaps to unfurl the cloud stalks of the day lily, enough for the fields of drought to whisper harvest. Memory lies buried now in the descent of rain, the disquiet of poplars, his eyes in her eyes like the history of thought, holy without origin. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. He uttered those words as if they ached him, steep staircase of his arms and legs as she held him, the authorities giving her that final hour, that opening of time salving the soul in exile, bread torn from bread, wreath on water, his voice silk of blue smoke shuddering the horizon at morning over the wind-severed valley and his death like a boat dissolved into the yet again. Thank you.